Session 77 Chapter 2, Verses 52 and 53 Then we pardoned you after that, so that perhaps you would be grateful. Chapter 2, Verse 52 God showers the children of Israel with mercy even after they committed the gravest of sins. He forgave them so all of us may know that our Lord is all-merciful. He opens the doors of repentance, one after the other, to wash away the evil deeds of humanity. When you sin, you temporarily depart the domain of faith. If repentance and pardoning were not legislated, then people would have despaired and continually sinned, thinking that after their first sin they were destined to hellfire. Allah wants good for all of His creation and wants to bring everyone back into the fold of faith. He says, Say, My servants who have harmed yourselves by your own excess, do not despair of God's mercy. God forgives all sins. He is truly the most forgiving, the most merciful. Chapter 39, verse 53 Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, God is happier with the repentance of His servant than one of you finding your horse after it had strayed away in the middle of the desert. This narration illustrates a traveling man with all his possessions, be it wealth, food, and water, packed on the back of his animal. In the midst of a barren desert, the horse gets away from him. He looks for it for days to no avail. Not only has he lost the horse, but he lost all the necessities for survival. Suddenly, he turns around and finds it standing before him. Imagine the amount of happiness, joy, and relief this man feels. This pales when compared with God's happiness when you repent to Him and seek forgiveness for your sins. Allah opens the doors of repentance because He wants life in this world to move on. In fact, quite often the best of deeds and charities come from those who have sinned and transgressed. God says, Establish prayer at each end of the day and in the first part of the night. Good actions eradicate bad actions. This is a reminder for people who pay heed. Chapter 11, verse 114 And in another verse, Take alms out of their wealth, so that you may thereby cleanse them and cause them to grow in purity and sincerity, and pray for them. Indeed, your prayer is a source of comfort for them. God is all-hearing, all-knowing. Chapter 9, verse 103 God forgave the Israelites after their blatant sin because He wants to allow good to prevail in the universe. Moreover, Allah gave them a great chance to reform all aspects of life by revealing the Torah, which brings us to the next verse of the cow. God says, Remember when we gave Moses the scripture and the means to distinguish right and wrong so that you might be guided. Chapter 2, verse 53 after witnessing one of the greatest miracles in parting the sea and the drowning of Pharaoh and his army, the Israelites should have had unshakable faith free of any doubt. Did witnessing these great events remove the disbelief and hypocrisy from their hearts? Sadly, the answer is no. They remain stubborn throughout. The prophet, peace be upon him, cautioned all of us from becoming hardened like the children of Israel. When you make things difficult for yourself, God in return makes things difficult for you. Take the example of the incident of the cow, which the current chapter is named after. A murder had occurred, and it almost stirred up war between two tribes of the Israelites. God ordered the sacrifice of a cow in order to solve this murder case. Rather than simply carrying out God's command, the villagers kept delaying and asking unnecessary questions such as the type of cow, its color, and so on. If they would have sacrificed any random cow, it would have been sufficient. They made it difficult for Prophet Moses, so in return, God made things difficult for them. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said to his companions, Leave me as long as I let you be. For the people who were before you were ruined because of their questions and quarrels with their prophets. So if I order you to do something, then do it as much as you can. And if I forbid you from something, then just leave it. 
The scripture and the means to distinguish right from wrong were great blessings for the children of Israel to cherish and remember. You should always welcome divine obligation and commandments with an open heart. Do not consider faith and obligation as restrictions on your freedom. Quite the contrary, divine law and order is the ultimate freedom. Take the example of theft. When Allah made theft unlawful for you, He did not restrict your freedom. Rather, He protected you, because He commanded everyone else not to steal from you. Similarly, when He commanded you against committing adultery, He also commanded everyone else to keep away from your family. This is a great protection for the entire human race. Thus, the Torah was a great gift for the children of Israel to free them from all society's ills. It detailed the heavenly law and doctrine. God also gave them guidance to distinguish truth from falsehood. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Convey my teachings to the people, even if it is only a single verse. Please take a moment to subscribe and to share with your family and friends. Visit us at www.qurangarden.com Session 78 Chapter 2 Verse 54 And when Moses said to his people, O oh, my people, indeed you have wronged yourselves by your taking of the calf. So repent to your Creator and kill yourselves. That is best for you in the sight of your Creator. Then he accepted your repentance. Indeed, he is the all-forgiving, the most merciful. Chapter 2, verse 54 the sin committed by the Israelites in Moses' absence was very grave. They took a gold calf as an idol. This is while Moses was receiving Torah and the commandments of his Lord. God informed Moses that his people have been misled and began the worship of an idol. Moses was grief-stricken. He returned full of rage and seized his brother Aaron by his beard and hair. Moses yelled, Didn't I appoint you as my deputy? How could you let them go astray? Aaron replied, He said, Son of my mother, let go of my beard and my hair. I was afraid you would say, You have caused division among the children of Israel and have not heeded what I said. Chapter 20, verse 94 The truth is, that the Samiri was the one who misled them and called them to the worship of the golden calf. He took advantage of the fact that the Israelites were already asking Moses for an idol or a physical manifestation of God. He convinced them that this calf, which made a very loud noise, was their Lord and the Lord of Moses. How can God allow such things to happen, you may ask? Don't be surprised by the fact that events may run in the favor of evil and corruption for a while. God allows this to happen in order to test His servants. Truth and justice are heavy burdens that need men and women of strong and true character to carry and fight for them. These men and women are sculpted and finessed by tests and trials. Take the example of the believers who suffered immensely in the early days of Islam only to carry its message to all corners of the world a few years later. Before the Prophet's migration to Medina, he and his followers suffered at the hands of the disbelievers. After being abused, ridiculed, and sanctioned by the Quraysh, he, peace be upon him, went to the tribe of Taif to invite them to Islam, and in the hopes of getting some support. He was confronted with refusal and mockery. The town even set their young boys to chase him away with stones that left the prophet's heels soaked with blood. After which he raised his hands toward the sky and made the heartfelt supplication to his Lord, O oh God, I appeal to you, for I am weak, short on power, and for the mistreatment, contempt, and disregard I received from my people. It was at that time 
and after all these tests and trials, that Allah honored the Prophet with the night journey and the ascension to the heavens. The early followers of Islam were also subjected to abuse and persecution. These trials prepared them to carry the new faith with love and tolerance over hardship. Allah trains them to become patient over afflictions, powerful before their opponents, and able to handle difficulties with grace. This is the way true faith is built and measured. It is in sharp contrast to man-made governing systems that are often designed to benefit the few and the elite. Members of the central committees of the communist parties are rich, while the whole population suffers wearing cheap attire and living in small houses. Capitalists prey on the weak and exploit natural resources with no regard for future generations. So is the case with every cause for falsehood. The cause for good is exactly the opposite. The preacher of truth is often the first to sacrifice and often the one who suffers the most. He or she is rarely around to reap the benefits of the truth. You can reliably use this fact to spot good and evil causes. Any movement or mission that grants plenty of wealth and influence to its leaders early on is built on a false cause. This brings us back to the verse. Prophet Moses is reprimanding his people for failing their test and committing the worst possible deviation from the path of monotheism to the calf worshipping. He said, O oh my people, indeed you have wronged yourselves by your taking of the calf. The natural question to ask here is, did those who worship the calf wrong themselves or did they wrong God? The answer is simple. They were unjust towards themselves because they brought themselves destruction without gaining any benefit. God says, When Luqman said to his son as he advised him, O oh my son, do not ascribe any partners to Allah. Polytheism is indeed a great injustice. Chapter 3, verse 13 God described associating partners to him as a great injustice. This is because when you regard something or someone that did not create nor provided nor nourished as an equivalent to Allah who creates, provides and nourishes, you would be unfair. Worship is the obedience of the servant towards his or her Lord. Did the gold calf provide the Israelites with anything? Did it create anything or was it created by the Samiri? Taking the calf for worship is one of the greatest injustices one can commit. This act, however, affects the person committing it and does not affect God. Whether you believe in Allah or you do not, He will remain the all-powerful, the all-competent, and the distinguished. Your faith or disbelief in Him will not decrease anything in His kingdom. Your beliefs and actions will only reflect on you. You can enjoy a few days, weeks, or even years devouring other people's rights. You can take full advantage of God's bounties without any gratitude. Eventually, you will die and face the consequences of your actions. God says, It was not us they wronged. They wronged themselves. Chapter 2, verse 57「The Messenger said, My Lord, my people treat this Qur'an as something to be ignored. » Chapter 25, verse 30 « Do not abandon God's book. Please take a moment to subscribe and to share with your family and friends. Visit us at www.qur'angarden.com Session 79 Chapter 2 Verses 54 and 55 And when Moses said to his people, O oh my people, indeed you have wronged yourselves by your taking of the calf, so repent to your Creator and kill yourselves. That is best for you in the sight of your Creator. Then he accepted your repentance. Indeed, he is the all-forgiving the most merciful. Chapter 2, verse 54. 
God accepts the repentance of a person who seeks forgiveness from sin and who is determined not to repeat the same mistake. Repentance is actually the basis of forgiveness. Allah could have seized and destroyed the children of Israel as he did with the previous nations when they indulged in grave sins. But his mercy encompassed them and they were given another chance. He said, So repent to your Creator. God's names Al-Khalaq and Al-Bari are usually translated into the same English name, the Creator. In the Arabic language, however, they carry two distinct meanings. Al-Khalaq is the one who creates from nothing, while Al-Bari is the one who fashions and shapes in perfect proportions. Creating and proportioning are different, as Allah highlights in the following verses. Glorify the name of your Lord the Most High, who created in due proportion, He who determined and guided. Chapter 87, verses 1 through 3. In the verse under discussion, God asked the Israelites to repent to Him, Al-Bari, the one who perfected their creation. The Israelites disbelieved in the one who perfected them, and they worshipped a gold calf. So the command came, Repent to your Creator and kill yourselves. In essence, they were asked to return the life and creation they were given to the one who granted it to them in the first place. By repeatedly abusing the gift of life and wasting the grant of guidance, they lost the privilege of life. After the command was issued, the Israelites lined up, and the ones who had not worshipped the calf were commissioned to kill the calf worshippers. It was extremely difficult for them, as many were asked to kill their own relatives and friends. God sent down heavy fog all around them to make this terrible task easier. Prophets Moses and Aaron advised their people to weep and plead before God. Perhaps He will pardon them. The verse continues, That is best for you in the sight of your Creator. Death was prescribed in this situation as a way to wipe out their sin. God ordered this form of repentance as it expressed sincere remorse and provided protection from punishment in the hereafter. Allah wants the best for His creation, and while His command was extreme in the sight of the Israelites, it did save them from punishment in hellfire. In the sight of God, being saved from hellfire and then being admitted into paradise is the true success. By obeying his command, the calf worshipper brought back true piety to their soul that rebelled against God and earned it everlasting forgiveness and permanent life in paradise. God says, He accepted your repentance. Indeed, He is the all-forgiving, the most merciful. Now we move on to the next verse in the cow. God says, And when you said, Moses, we will not believe in you until we see Allah with our own eyes. So the thunderbolt struck you dead while you were looking. Chapter 2, verse 55 In the past few verses, detailing the actions of the children of Israel, we are presented with valuable lessons. Allah is inviting us to study the actions of those who were granted scriptures and heavenly guidance. How did they act? What were the results of the choices they made? The answers to these questions apply to all humanity and to all heavenly messages. With great gifts comes great responsibility and accountability. Will we learn from these lessons? Or are we bound to ignore them and fall into the same traps? The current verse illustrates how the Israelites squandered one gift after another. They continued their quest for what is physical and tangible, and disregarded spirituality and faith, even after being pardoned for worshipping the golden calf. They said, Moses, we will not believe in you until we see Allah with our own eyes. This request shows true ignorance about the majesty and grandeur of Allah. He says, Eyesight comprehends him not, but he comprehends all eyesight. He is the all-subtle, the all-aware. Chapter 6, verse 103 Allah's being is beyond human comprehension. 
In fact, there are many matters that are beyond our comprehension. Those who are focused on materialistic things, who only believe in what is physical and tangible, have a very hard time understanding this issue. Allah brings it to our attention in the following verses. On earth there are signs for those with sure faith and within yourselves. Can you not perceive? Chapter 51, verses 21 and 22. God placed within each one of us the highest level of evidence of that which cannot be seen, touched, or physically measured. It is the soul. Human bodies are objects that require the presence of a soul to bring them to life. Modern science and medicine understand that life and movement are not only the result of a proper physical form, rather there is something else that is needed to produce life. The human soul cannot be seen, touched, measured, or felt. We know it is there by its effects. When the soul is taken, life ends, and the body, regardless of its condition, becomes still. If you cannot see or comprehend the soul that resides within your own body, then how do you demand to see God? If you cannot see the creation within you, how can you see the Creator? Allah says, They ask you about the soul. Say, The soul is part of my Lord's domain. You have only been given a little knowledge. Chapter 17, verse 85 Let's take a moment to examine the expression, until we see Allah with our own eyes. The verb see can be used to refer to knowledge rather than physical sight. For example, Have you seen him who has taken his whims and desires to be his God? Will you then be his guardian? Chapter 25, verse 43 Meaning, did you know about, or are you aware? In another example, when a teacher explains a mathematical concept to you, you might say, I see, meaning, I understand. But when the verse added, with our own eyes, it negated the Israelites asking for true knowledge or awareness of Allah. Rather, their request was for the physical observation of God. Again, this request shows the lack of faith and a life totally based on materialism. The Israelites' unjust demand to see God stems from their lack of understanding of all the evidence that was available to them regarding the Lord. Let's look at the facts they had at the time. God Almighty says, When Moses came for the appointment, and his Lord spoke to him, he said, My Lord, show yourself to me, let me see you. He said, You will never see me, but look at that mountain. If it remains standing firm, you will see me. And when his Lord revealed himself to the mountain, he made it crumble. Moses fell down unconscious. When he recovered, he said, Glory be to you. To you I turn in repentance. I am the first to believe. Chapter 7, verse 143 The issue of seeing God in this world has been absolutely settled. There is no way to see God while we exist in our current form. The human body is governed by certain laws in this world and by a different set of laws in the hereafter. For example, in this world, the human body discharges waste and impurities, while in the hereafter, the body will be pure, producing no waste. We are now bound by age and time, but in the hereafter, youth will be forever. Thus, there is a clear difference between the two, which brings us back to the verse. In this world, one cannot see God. But in the hereafter, the greatest bounty granted to the believers is the ability to see Allah. He says, On that day, there will be radiant faces looking at their Lord. Chapter 75, verses 22 and 23 How could this be, you may ask? Humans have invented tools such as the microscope to observe what we could not see with the naked eye. Similarly, nowadays an eye specialist is able to treat the eyes of a patient so that he or she will not require the use of glasses or contacts again. If man was able to invent tools that made it possible to see what he could not see before, 
Then imagine the power of God to transform our abilities in the hereafter so that we may enjoy our Lord's company. God had proved this issue to Moses. The mountain, despite its size and strength, was unable to bear the light of God. Moses, peace be upon him, could not handle the sight of the mountain being affected by God's light. It was as if God wanted to explain to Moses that he was deprived of seeing the Lord out of mercy for him. After all, if the mountain crumbled at the sight of God's light, then imagine what would have happened to Moses. The prophet, peace be upon him, said, Convey my teachings to the people, even if it is only a single verse. Please take a moment to subscribe and to share with your family and friends. Visit us at www.qurangarden.com.